So Alex Young and I co-created a company called Clarify. I moved here about five years ago. I've got 15 years of risk management experience. And uh, still not working? Still not working. Can you guys hear me now? And uh, so I moved out here to Ohio from the desert of Arizona. I was a military brat. Anybody else here in the military? Anybody family of military? Thank you guys for all of your service and your family members. So I moved out here in 2015. Love it. It's a fantastic place to raise kids. It's a fan fantastic place to do business. A little bit competitive. Um, I like to live by a motto that goes a little like this. You have to have a desire to inspire before you require. So what does that mean? It means if you're going to talk to somebody and tell them to do something, especially something different than what they're used to, you've got to speak beyond the task. You've got to talk to them about why. And I'm not talking about my why. I'm talking about their why. You see, most people in life, if you're like me, most of us, have two moments that matter, the day we're born and the day we find out why. I've spent the last 15 years climbing, crawling, failing, trying, and learning from entrepreneurs all across the country. And it led us to create Clarify. Clarify is a platform that enables collaborative communication in a world of reactive players. You see, I think that if we work together, we can overcome any obstacle if we're more proactive and more engaged with our business owners. Small business today accounts for 99.7% of the US economic employment system. That's a big number, 99.7%. We use it to measure the success of our cities, of our states, our nations, and the world. But somewhere along the way, we took small business, we tossed it to the side, and we focused on the 1%. We started creating platforms and products that self-performed and pointed right to that 1% to try to grab hold. And I think that's a little bit wrong. I think if we can find a way to elevate the other 99%, forgive me if I'm wrong, but that's a bigger target. We should focus on that. You see, most people forget that a pledge and a purpose will always outperform a pitch and a promise. A pitch is momentary. It's transactional. It's short-sighted. It's tied to a promise to fulfill some short-term obligation, some goal, right? Things like, I'm going to get your taxes done fast for you. I'm going to find you the cheapest insurance quote. The first thing I'm going to do is send you this legal form. We're going to fill it out as fast as we can and as cheap as possible. We show up like waiters. We take your order, and then we do nothing to make recommendations, elevate your thought, or make your world better. And that's falling short. And that's how Clarify was born. We realized that there was a problem. We need to focus back on elevating each other, grabbing a hold of their vision, and, risk, and stretching their needs a little bit beyond where they were. If you have a pledge and a purpose, it lets your clients know that you're in the trenches with them. You see, our needs change. Our business evolves, our structures, and our perspective. If you're tied to a promise, you might, not re you might not be relevant today, tomorrow, the next day. But if you're in it for the long run, you've got a pledge and a purpose to build something better and bigger than yourself, then you're always going to be relevant. I want to share with you guys a couple of stories about some clients I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. There's three clients in particular that come to mind, one that I helped start build, and leave a legacy. Okay? First client was Kevin. Kevin was one of my smallest clients I ever started with. Kevin was a one-man shop, had a beat-up truck, big dream, wanted to own a large construction company. Kevin needed to understand what it meant to do certain things and understand contracts and what his risks were. Now, Kevin wouldn't have his calls returned by his agent because he wasn't big enough. I said, Kevin, no, no problem, man. Come on down, sit down, we'll talk about it. I'll teach you anything you want to know. He said, Adam, I can't do that. I'm my company. I don't have time to slow down. I've got a family to feed. I've got bills to pay. What can we do? So I went out and met Kevin at a gas station. We spent about five minutes figuring out what his needs were. I left. I came back. I met him on a job site. We talked about what contracts mean, what the risks were, what he needed to look out for, and what he could be aware of, and the opportunities. Now, his agent wouldn't return his call. Kevin was too small for him. He was a foreign national, small little guy, beat up truck, big dreams. Kevin's my largest client. And Kevin's my largest client because I thought beyond the task. I was able to sit down and talk to him about some things that could empower him and lift him up. Story number two, Armando. 
Armando was one of my favorite clients. He's a family man, had a big company. He ran a health food catering company for charter schools. Armando's business was getting big. It's getting strong. Armando was the face of his company. He did the negotiating. He was the chef. He met with the faculty members. He did everything that was involved. And because of that, we had to start asking some hard questions. Armando, what would happen to you if you were gone for a week? Armando, what would happen to you if you were hospitalized for a month? Armando, what would happen to you if, God forbid, a 16-year-old texting and driving took you out and you did not come home? What would happen to your family? What would happen to your business, your partners? These are hard questions to ask. So we started exploring some of his needs, how to protect his family. I come from a risk management background, so I'm kind of a hypochondriac. I had a promise. I was going to fulfill his need. I was going to protect his family and take care of his company. I failed. After we were talking to Armando, we set up everything. We did the tests, and it turned out that a guy who was involved in running a health food catering company was one of the most unhealthy people you'd ever meet. You'd never see it on the outside. You see, he had, he had a bad cholesterol problem. I failed because I wasn't able to put protections in place, and I had to put my head down, tuck my tail between my legs, and go and talk to his family about why I wasn't able to meet the promise, you know, pitching a promise in the moment. I wasn't ready for what happened. When I went to go meet with Armando and explain to his wife what, what, why I couldn't insure them and why I couldn't help him out, his wife ran past him, crying, embraced me, and thanked me. She thanked me because we uncovered an obstacle that they didn't know existed. We found out that he has, had been living an unhealthy lifestyle and he might not be here the next year. He had to make some changes. He had to go to the gym, take time off, eat healthier. Because of that, he had to loosen the reins on his company. He had to put some management people in place. He had to start teaching some of his employees some of the things he was doing. And in doing so, his business grew. I failed, but the business succeeded. You can't be afraid to fail if you're in it for a purpose that's bigger than yourself. And that's, that's what advisors should be doing today. That's what our partners should be doing today. Story number three, Jackie. Jackie was one of the first clients I ever got. She owned a small paving company out in southern Arizona. She'd been running it for about 20 years. And I kid you not, the first time I called her, I, I was cold calling. That's what you do when you don't have clients, right? You cold call. She picked up the phone and said, hey, I'm Adam over. And she says, no, 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 I don't take cold calls. Click. And she hung up on me. So I did what any self-respecting risk manager would do. I got in the car and I drove to her office. I opened the door, I walked in, and I shook her hand and said, hi, I'm Adam. You don't take cold calls. Let's have a conversation. She laughed. It was a great icebreaker. I wasn't afraid at that point, which is great because we had a conversation. We made a few changes. And we've done business for about 10 years at this point. A decade goes by, and Jackie calls me. Jackie's not the easiest client to deal with. She doesn't take cold calls. I mean, I'll tell you right there, she doesn't like to ask questions. She calls me up, and she says, Adam, I want to retire. I'm done. I said, OK, Jackie, cool. You've lived a long, good life. What are you going to do? She says, well, here's the problem. I don't know how I can retire, because I've got this ridiculous buy-sell I need to execute and no one's going to help me, so I've got two choices. Either you learn how to do it, or I'm going to liquidate the company and lay everybody off. Wow. That is not my job. That is, I could have stopped right there, said, nope, sorry, not on the menu. Not going to help you out. But I knew that there was 45 other people attached to this company. There was a key employee that I respected the hell out of that was ready to take the reins and make it bigger and better than it could have ever been. So I made a few calls. I brought in some legal professionals, because I don't know legalese. I don't speak that. I brought in a CPA and a wealth manager, because we don't want to mess up somebody's taxes. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, we, we want to make sure that she rests happy and the company's not broken. It took nine months, but we got the job done. It wasn't my job. But I was able to see beyond the task at hand. You see, we spend too much time complicating things, and I think we need to start talking strategy and stop talking manager. We need to start talking tactical and practical and less of this technical spectacle. 
Nobody wants to stay up reading the IRS tax code. No one wants to understand insurance jargon. Even I don't want to understand that. Nobody wants to read legalese. Nobody wants to, to gamble with their retirement and play devil's advocate. You see, small business accounts for 99% of our economic system, and we've left them behind. It's time that we stepped up, re-embraced the trust, we start collaborating proactively, and we give them confidence. If we can give them confidence, then they can start focusing on the things that matter, which is to chase their desire to build, retain, and hire. A pledge and a purpose, not a pitch and a promise.